Antibiotics are used to treat and cure diseases caused by bacteria. There are other antifungal and antiviral which deal with different microbes, but we're talking about inhibiting the growth and basically those organisms which are causing disease in people or animals. The initial finding of an antibiotic goes back to the 30s with a not necessarily a true antibiotic, but a sulfur drug, which did affect and help cure certain pneumonias, uh, which were a uh, difficulty to the troops in the, in the war. We also then heard the famous story about Alexander Fleming and his discovery of penicillin, which then set the stage for an even bigger recognition of the fact that people can make drugs which will inhibit the growth of bacteria that are causing diseases in people and in this way be able to save lives, save hospitalizations. The problem is that something this good was beginning to be misused. Penicillin was touted a miracle drug. Those who were using it were claiming it could do all sorts of things, cure cancer, for instance, cure all sorts of infectious diseases, and so uh, it became known as the miracle drug. And the find, finder of it, Alexander Fleming, uh, went, on tell, went on all sorts of media to describe the wonders of this drug and uh, his collaborators and uh, others in England, uh, such as Ernest Chain and, and collaborators, were finding ways to make penicillin so it could be used as a therapeutic. The initial finding was serendipitous, and he was aware of the potential, but had none of the manpower to make enough of the drug to demonstrate that it was effective. Alexander Fleming was among the first, if not the first, to warn that once an antibiotic becomes available to the public as an oral medication, that it will be misused, and with misuse will come what he called resistance. He was way ahead of his time there, too and that, in fact, resistance meant that the drug would not work against the bacteria because they had incorporated changes in their structure and changes in their material that made them unaffected uh, by the antibiotic, penicillin being one of the first, but then going on to many other antibiotics, including those we face today. Bacteria are crazy creatures. Uh, they will live even if you try to kill them. They have a facility to pick up mutations on their own or borrowing them from other bacteria so that the drug does not work. The bacteria go along causing the infection, uh, infecting people, spreading, and it now is vastly changed. It has its original makeup, but it now includes pieces of DNA that allow the organism to survive the antibiotic, and they become what we call resistant to the antibiotic therapy. There are many mechanisms for resistance to antibiotics. One is it can destroy the antibiotic. This mechanism is carried by the resistant bacterium. The antibiotic can be destroyed. The antibiotic can be pumped out so it never gets inside. The antibiotic can substitute for some other kinds of mechanisms so it lives despite the fact that it's surrounded by the antibiotic. These changes in the individual bacterium can be transferred to many other bacteria so that you accumulate resistance in locations where the spread of the resistance gene is easy to see and which is easy to transfer and so resistance mounts and the antibiotic you chose does not work. We know that some of the resistances involve breaking down the antibiotic itself. 
Penicillin, for instance, its resistance is due to an enzyme which destroys the drug penicillin. That enzyme destroys it by interfering chemically with its uh, ability to be uh, made, and once it's made, it's susceptibility to being destroyed. So destruction of the drug, even one little mutation would affect how the drug works against many different diseases. The question is asked, where did resistance emerge? Well, quite honestly, it emerged in the environment. But where we first saw it was in the treatment of human patients in hospitals around the world and also in the United States. So resistance became an entity recognized by clinicians as a possibility that the drug wouldn't work. And in fact, it was problematic because as new antibiotics were being discovered, alongside were bacterium that had accumulated, gotten, mutated to resistance. So resistance became a shadow of the antibiotic and impeded its success. So the miracle drug wasn't so miraculous, or at least the bacteria were able to get around it in one way or the other, either keeping it out of the bacterium or destroying it when it got in. There are a lot of changes in the hospitals today as opposed to when they were initially seen as places to treat uh, in the 1950s. I think the answer is that these genetic elements that could make a bacterium resistant, not susceptible, were beginning to be at play because bacteria are not there to be destroyed. They're not going to give up. They're going to replicate. They're going to make new copies of themselves but with the resistance involved. So the question is why the hospitals? As Willie Sutton said about money, why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. Well in this case that's where the antibiotic is and that's where the resistance is. So people and clinicians and, and infectious disease people and scientists began to study resistance and found that what's unique is multi-drug resistance. That is that the bacterium is not just carrying resistance to one drug, but to two, three, four other structurally unrelated different mechanisms, but protecting that bacterium from the drug and therefore escaping the activity of the resistant of the uh, susceptibility me mechanism. One asks why resistance. The answer is twofold: basically misuse, and also uh, overuse. And the problem is that. We still bear, or people still bear, the idea that antibiotics are miracles and they can do no harm. So the more you use, the better they are. Well, that's clearly not the case. Bacteria have shown us that the more you use, the more chance you're going to have resistance, which is going to thwart your ability to treat your patient. So there's a movement afoot to eliminate, for instance, the ban, uh, to eliminate the use of antibiotics for growth promotion. There's a educational push by many societies, including the Alliance for Prudent Use of Antibiotics, to improve how we use the drugs, to recognize that, in fact, there's a downsize to overuse, a big downsize, especially when we are not putting investments into new antibiotics. We have to use the older ones in a better way. Many of us in the antibiotic field are disappointed in the fact that the large pharmaceutical companies have left the antibiotic discovery field and have gone to spend their time and monies on drugs that are used more chronically, weeks at a time. Antibiotics, as we know, we want them to work rapidly. Mm -hmm. They're not to be used on a weekly, monthly basis. So the return on the investment was not what the companies wanted, and so they're just a handful of antibiotic producing companies that still exist and they're not yet there with new antibiotics so we're stuck with uh, 
the fact that we have to use some of the old ones and the bacteria are already resistant to them. So we have to then devise either combinations of drugs or other ways. Certainly prevention of disease is critical, but it is true that we are in a critical, very critical time period where we do not have the luxury of new antibiotics. The use of antibiotics in animal food and in animal growing and animal raising was a serendipitous discovery by scientists who found that trace amounts of antibiotics put into the feed would allow chickens and beef cattle to grow with less need of protein. So in fact, they were gaining more weight, making more protein with the food that they were getting. And this was a unique discovery. It opened up a field that is still existing here in the United States, but no longer in Europe. What I'm saying is antibiotics are being given in small, not therapeutic amounts to beef cattle, to pigs, to chickens, to help them grow better for less food or feed. And this has opened up an area of antibiotic misuse, in my opinion, because on one hand, we are raising our animals more hygienically and the need for an antibiotic supplement, however it works, is much less. But what this use does is create an environment of drug-resistant bacteria which are associated with the animals being fed the antibiotic and those animals then excrete resistant bacteria which then eventually get to people because it's on the meat that they buy. In most studies show the antibiotic is not in the meat. What's the problem are the resistant bacteria that are associated with the meat. With the fact that we don't have a pipeline of new antibiotics, with the fact that resistance comes in multiples, not just single resistances, and the fact that so much antibiotic is being given to animals for growth promotion, more than which given to people for treatment, there is a movement to stop this use, to ban the use of antibiotics as growth promoters. And it's been a problem that I've been facing and arguing for for more than three decades. Finally, finally, in the, 19, uh, in the 2000s, we're seeing a change in the fact that companies, fa uh, factory farmers and all, are beginning to look at this issue of antibiotic use as growth promoters and reserving antibiotics, if they're needed for animals, for prophylaxis or treatment. Antibiotics don't destroy themselves. Perhaps it's one of the downside of them being miracles of sorts, because you don't want them being destroyed before they act. But quite honestly, they remain environmental in the excrement of animals. They get put on vegetable props. They, they have a life after their treatment. And this allows more and more resistance to emerge and so the environment of this antibiotic usage for growth promotion is vast mm -hmm. and maybe enormously larger than the amount of antibiotics used uh, for therapies. Right. The estimate of the Union of Scientists say that 80% of antibiotics are used now in the United States for growth promotion. Right. In Europe, this practice has been banned and we see that the animals are doing fine. And after a little bit of adjustment, we're getting meat from animals fed without antibiotics. I got into this field as a medical student. I elected and was pleased to be accepted to work in the laboratory of Dr. Sutomo Watanabe, a famous Japanese research scientist who was one of the discoverers of antibiotic resistance pieces, what we call plasmids or transposon, pieces of DNA that bear the resistance. He was one of the originators of the discovery. So having spent a few months with him and I returned to the States, I couldn't forget that experience.
and I also learned from Dr. Watanabe misuse, including the animal issue, which was prominent even at that time. So what I did was to then sort of take the mantle from Watanabe, who unfortunately passed away too soon. But in any case, for me, what was important was prudent use of antibiotics. And what was fascinating and unknown at the time was the genetics of resistance, where pieces of DNA, pieces of the genetic material, could go from one bacterium to another, even ones that were on an evolutionary tree more distant than dogs and cats. I mean, you're talking about major changes. And so a plasmid, piece of DNA, in a streptococcus could be found in a E. coli. That was pretty phenomenal. It's very interesting and somewhat frustrating to admit that there was suspicion. And the companies were concerned that what I was doing was putting a bad name on antibiotics. Many did not believe that antibiotic resistance created in animals had anything to do with antibiotic resistance created in people. It was like the two groups were on different planets and we knew it wasn't and we did some studies to show it, but it didn't matter. I became somewhat suspect. I became what was thought to be an enemy of pharmaceutical industry discovery, which was ridiculous. And I'm happy to say that I've survived all that and we're seeing changes that maybe are longer in f happening than they should have been, I know that, but are happening at least. Uh, when I first started my sort of interest in improving antibiotic uh, usage, uh, it was coming from a meeting in the Dominican Republic where for the first time scientists from the developing world were able to come to a meeting in a developing country and the word on the street and in the meetings was resistance. But the work on the resistance was being done by scientists in the developing world, in the developed world, so that the discovery of new resistances in countries which were not as sophisticated or without the same facilities would have this organism go to another country to be studied. And it was a strange phenomenon because the discovery of multi-drug resistance was occurring in normal bacteria and being studied, therefore, by those individuals in sophisticated laboratories. It was a nice getting together, but they weren't together at a meeting like this. What came out of this meeting was a misuse statement. Antibiotics are being misused. Resistance is a real problem. This problem was relatively simple in the 19, early 80s when we approached this and we began what was then the Alliance for Prudent Use of Antibiotics. It was meant to be a global organization, but made up of different groups from different countries. And I'm pleased to say that we now have chapters of APUA in 66 countries throughout the world. And the mission is appropriate use of antibiotics done by you in your own country for your own reasons and having selected what is the priority or the beginning of the first step to improve antibiotic use. The, uh, the Alliance for Prudent Use of Antibiotics was begun by myself along with the then a Mexican research scientist, Jacobo Cooperstock. And it was my idea that the activities should not be to one country, should not be an American activity, it should be a global activity. And so we began by helping to establish different countries-wide chapters of the Alliance. And in each chapter, the interested scientists, infectious disease people, would be working on the problem as it appears in their country. So it became a, the issue of the country. It wasn't the United States saying, you should do this or that. It was the country itself directing its people to use antibiotics more prudently, to look at 
is described as over-the-counter use of antibiotics where you don't need a prescription and they're given out one at a time, two at a time. All of these kind of misuses, some with reason, but at least it now was not another country telling this country what to do or that country. It was each individual country which dealt with the problem in his or her country. It's always an interesting experience to speak before congressional groups, especially if they're on two sides of the question. So the one more recent one was the issue of banning antibiotics in animal feeds, and that was several years ago. And it was before congressional committee that it consisted of those who favored this action and those who didn't, but it was not on scientific basis, it seemed to be on a political basis. That was very interesting for me. Because in the past, I testified in the 80s uh, for Gore, uh, uh, Congressman Gore's committee on health. And there, we discussed the issue of antibiotic misuse, the use in animals, and so forth. And he got a dressing down by the Congress representatives on the whole issue of Who's prescribing the drugs? Why are you prescribing them? Is there any influence of the pharmaceutical companies in this practice, which there was? But in any case, that was 84, I believe. And then we, nothing happens for another 20, 30 years, although we're out there actively creating APUA, finding areas that we can use uh, our information to help improve antibiotic usage, and helping chapters in Africa, in Southeast Asia, to establish themselves and give uh, a purpose to what they want to see is fantastic. The book came out of my frustration that physicians and consumers were using antibiotics in a wrong way and thought they knew what an antibiotic was when, in fact, most of them I spoke to thought an antibiotic was a different kind of treatment. They thought that uh, antibiotics were, uh, uh, that antibiotic resistance was something wrong with the person, not with the uh, drug, because the drug was being resisted. And one of the big problems facing clinicians and practicing physicians was that the patient demanded the antibiotic. The patient didn't understand it, but knew that they were miracle drugs. Why can't I have one? And it was almost reduced to the uh, fact that this is something I deserve. This is something you should give me, doctor. So this was a difficult area to enter in. If you're writing a book for clinicians, you really need to write a book for the consumer. So I wrote the first edition of The Antibiotic Paradox, which was the first of its kind, to describe different mechanisms of resistance, the history of antibiotic discovery, the history of drug discovery. And uh, I was pleased that it had a wonderful reception. And then 10 years later, I updated it with the second edition. And uh, it, too, was accepted widely and represents uh, a description of antibiotic misuse and overuse, but also how you use antibiotics better for the person, the consumer, not necessarily for the physician. I was speaking to the wrong crowd. Not that the physicians, some of them couldn't, help, couldn't be helped by this, but it was really the consumer that I needed to reach, and that's what I attempted to do with this book. I think that antibiotic resistance has revealed almost a science fiction yes, in <laughs> science. Who would have thought before plasmids were discovered, that you'd have pieces of DNA that could go from one bacterium to another of very different types mm -hmm. and carry with it the resistance genes which allowed the next bacteria to survive treatment, to complicate and unravel our ability to treat an infection with what were really touted as miracle drugs. And suddenly, you have resistance to them. How's that happen? Well, there was a lot of food for good discovery and understanding resistance, and it was fascinating because some of the mechanisms were very, very different, and yet they worked.
We're not sure they were there originally for antibiotics, but they were the reason that drugs didn't work. Resistance to antibiotics became a household term. I think the public needs to speak to their representatives and get companies back on track. We need new antibiotics because bacteria just becoming more and more resistant and it's not just the level of res resistances so that there are patients with whom you may not even have a drug to treat and that is outrageous for our civilization. We should be, if we can go to the moon, we can certainly find antibiotics, but we have to put our time and energy into it. So uh, I think that's one of the things. Two is to respect antibiotics. I think there's a lack of respect. There's a thinking that, oh, let's just try this one, or antibiotics will work, we know they will, and or I keep this in my medicine cabinet. If I have a scratchy th throat, I just take one and take one? Yeah, I take one and I feel a lot better. I said, yeah, but one isn't going to do anything. So that in the book I describe a number of scenarios of misuse, which some find shocking, but they're real and they're true. I would say that the Europeans politically are ahead of the U.S. in the sense that they have taken great strides to improve antibiotic use, to educate the public, and to eliminate overuse of antibiotics when they're not needed. The politics involved in changing a policy is much easier in Europe, we have seen, than in the United States, where changes require court hearings and uh, all sorts of different um, activities to changing a policy or changing an activity so that uh, I would say that Europe's ahead of us in that regard. What we're interested in now is two sides. One is uh, to understand better how bacteria escape so many different antibiotics, multi-drug resistance, and there are some interesting genes that are involved and we're studying those. Uh, the other area is relatively new. It's to prevent the infection in the first place. It's called antivirulence, and it's an antivirulence approach. So you have an infection that would come up with a patient who's put on a ventilator, and we know that that could be a couple percent each day, and you have an antibiotic, but it's not really killing. What it does is it prevents the bacteria from sitting down and causing an infection growing into an infection. It can't because we are killing or keeping out the bacteria that can make the infection and prevent them from doing it. They can live, mm -hmm. but they can't make an infection. Mm -hmm. And so this is, could be true for urinary tract infections, for um, post-surgical uh, uh, operations in which uh, the infection is likely and you could use an anti-infection agent to prevent it. You're not killing, you're not <laughs> selecting for resistance. It's a, a whole new approach, but it has validity. And we have animal models that show us it can work. I think that decades of looking back help a little because you see how numb the ears were in the 60s and 70s and how suddenly there's a stand-up call and a look to mm -hmm. new antibiotics. I think to some extent that's because the older generation in the pharmaceutical industry is passed on to some other places and the younger ones who were trained by us about resistance and about plasmids mm -hmm. and, and all the genetic machinery, I think they took over and said, yeah, resistance is a real entity. We should deal with that. The interesting discovery was it wasn't so easy to find new antibiotics. The history we told us we had penicillin and aminoglycosides and, and cephalosporins and all of the new antibiotics that were fabulous at the time, but we lost them to resistance. And then it wasn't easy to find new ones. And that created the big separation between the success of treatments versus the failure of treatments, whether it's on the farm or more likely in the hospital where we take the biggest toll.
the question is why the issue now? I think now is because one, large farmers has left the antibiotic discovery field to invest their investments in more lucrative areas such as chronic diseases where you're using a drug every day. It's not a five day or a 10 day treatment. So the return on the investment is much greater in the chronic drugs than in the acute. On the other hand, acute will kill you. So, I mean, it's being blinded mm -hmm. that you have a real need here and that, yes, you can get a good return, especially if you've got a good antibiotic. And we're lacking new antibiotics. We can hope that new ones will come through, but for the moment, this is a real loss.